po. So let's start. So good morning po. Welcome to the the 40th Paase anniversary and 2020 APAMS or Annual Scientific Meeting Philippines. Um, this is the parallel session on uh, museology, arts, culture, and indigenous knowledge. Uh, good morning po. I am JC Gonzalez from UP Los Baños. I am joined here by our host, uh, Dr. Benjamin Vallejo of the University of the Philippines, Tudiman. Morning, sir. Morning. Um, Good morning to everyone who attended. Uh, thank you for attending. Uh, so thank you again, JC. Uh, and I, I hope this uh, this parallel session will be very interesting. Uh, I see the list of speakers. Uh, they're very interesting. So please stay throughout the whole session. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Pastor. Good morning. So we have our speakers for today. Uh, we'll be joined, of course, by yours truly, Dr. Vallejo. Um, Dr. Carlos Antonio Palad, uh, Dr. Michelle Eusebio, um, Dr. Emily Dupon, and myself uh, will be in this session. So the session will be started um, by a, our foremost speaker. I am delighted to introduce to you our very first speaker to, for this parallel session on museology, arts, culture, and indigenous knowledge, Dr. Renee L. Litt Jr. Dr. June Litt is a Professor 12 and UP Scientist 3 at the Institute of Biological Sciences, College of Arts and Sciences, University of the Philippines, Los Baños. Um, he is an affiliate faculty at the Institute of Biology, College of Science, UP Didiman. He is also one of the curators and uh, was the previous director of the UPLB Museum of Natural History. And for nine years, sir, right? Uh, he holds a PhD in entomology specializing in the systematics of scale insects and a few other groups of terrestrial arthropods. Actually, he had um, several interesting um, new species. Kasama po dyan yung uh, uh, the Sibuyan stick insect, which is one of the largest yes. stick insects, and the Basilan yes, yes. violin um, beetle. Yeah. Uh, he is, of course, a member of the ASE, the NRCP, OIS, and of course, a lot more others. So I am delighted to welcome our first speaker. He will be speaking about courses in curatorship, uh, the continuing challenge of training future caretakers of priceless biological collections. Um, let us welcome Dr. Jun Lee. Okay. Uh, should I share screen or should... Okay. Hello. Yeah. Morning, po, sir. Share screen. Na. Mag share screen na lang ako. Oh. Yes, well, share screen. Share screen yun lang. Yeah. Share okay, screen. Lang. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Is that seen now? Okay. Good morning to all. Magandang umaga po sa lahat. My talk is entitled "Courses in Curatorship: The Continuing Challenge of Training Future." Caretakers of Prices Biological Collections. I think this co-authored with my colleagues here listed. And I thank, I thank Paase and Drs. Valleja and Gonzalez for this chance to talk this morning on a topic that started as a series of questions that date back to 1987. That was when I started working as a research assistant in the UPLB Museum of Natural History. Since 2002, I've, I have also been appointed curator and, and was its director from 2006 to early 2015. All these 33 years, the appointment of curators, their credit loads, qualifications, compensation have been contentious issues. Oh, I am like shipping. Hello. Next slide, ayaw, sorry po, something's, ayaw mag shift ng slide, taglit lang. Okay, so these questions include what is curation in a biological museum or uh, second, who or what is a curator what are the qualifications of a curator? 
what are his or her duties and responsibilities, and should a curator services be compensated and how? This last question arose from comments like, bakit bibigyan ng three units credit ay nagpapalit lang naman ng mothballs? Or why should curators be given three units credit load when they just change mothballs? As a former director of the MNH, who needed to answer questions from the higher administrators, and as a teacher who needs to answer students' questions, I also realized the need to clarify issues about curators and curating, and the duties and responsibilities of curators to science, and to the greater community of users of scientific collections and scientific information, as well as the need to train future systematists and curators. To clarify these issues about curation and curators, we need to define what, what really is a curator. Defining natural history with descriptive study of everything about nature. It's largely biology, but also some geology and a little bit of astronomy. Through the years, however, natural history became largely biological giving birth to systematics, ecology, evolutionary biology, and biogeography. In fact, many of the early great biologists like Linnaeus, Darwin, and Wallace started as in natural history museums. Nowadays, biological museums are centers of research in biological fields, those fields that I have enumerated. They are centers of uh, documentation, centers of education, which can be both formal and informal, and centers of information as well as extension. In some Euro European universities, in fact, museums are affiliated with universities and can grant research PhD degrees. Because of their research programs, museums are, museum activities involve field work, especially uh, <clears throat> especially those uh, but not limited to expeditions. Lab work, which nowadays also includes molecular lab work and museum work. Such activities, although greater in scientific inputs and outputs, are often shadowed by exhibits and museum visitors programs, which are obviously more popular, in fact, so popular, that people would equate museums with exhibits. However, the collections on display generally represent only a small fraction of the total holdings of a museum, in a museum. That great wealth ranging from live microbial cultures to preserved specimens. So working from that definition of a biological museum, a curator therefore is a specialist in a group of organisms or a taxon charged with or responsible for, for an institution's biological collections and involved with the collection, study, care, and management of his or her group of specialty and assigned responsibility. Hence, a biological museum curator generally is equivalent to a taxonomist and or ecologist or a related specialist. As a scientist, he, she communicates with peers and other researchers through scientific publications. And as the public face of the museum where he works, he or she uh, is by default a science communication specialist. He who communicates with museum artists, the general public, especially visitors, the conventional and social media, and unavoidably at times with policymakers, funding sources, and politicians. On top of this, he manages collections and highly skilled biological and therefore is a highly skilled biological technician. Collections management is actually one major task of curators to ensure that collections are available for use by many other taxonomists and serious students. Availabil availability of a specimen means that its value for science as the holder and source of data is always upheld. The responsibility of ensuring such availability and usefulness is greatest when you speak of type material like holotypes, paratypes, or isotypes, 
which are the official name bearers of species and other taxa. <clears throat> such is our greatest responsibility such is among our greatest responsibility to humanity, to science. Much more than just changing mothballs, therefore, the collections manager's jobs includes, one, ensuring that collections undergo proper processing, that means collection, preservation, maintenance, proper methods and storage, organizing collections for faster retrieval and traceability, checking that all things and persons secure and abide by ethical standards, laws, and international agreements. And our current director, JC Gonzalez, makes sure that all specimens collected by staff of the museum and those donated or deposited with us are not poached, that they do not violate Republic Act 9147. Number four, linking, uh, linking, or networking with other scientific collections. So it has become clear that curatorship is both a responsibility and a career. And there's also a need to train future curators. This has become more pressing during the last decade when with the retirement or untimely demise of taxonomist colleagues, I suddenly realized that I had become the most senior in active service within our group. That need has become more obvious during this COVID-19 pandemic also, and there are two main reasons. First, the aging population of systematists. Second, the demand for updated taxonomic information and access to specimens in preserving museums is increasing. To reiterate, roughly more than 50% of the curators in the UPLV MNH are in the age range of 51 to 65, plus a few ever reliable 66 and above. In demographies, in, the, in demographics, this is really a sad picture of a dwindling population. My main argument for using the term aging is that based on the nature of our work, uh, where less field work can be done. Why? Because one is in the peak of his or her academic career. And second, that's when the uric acid accumulation in the joints plus other health problems start to set in and therefore affect physical strength. Take note also that under ECQ and MECQ, the rule is 21 to 59, meaning that all curators aged 60 and above may find it difficult check culture restrictions. It seems that the community of curators are poorly, are poor in recruitment, using parlance in population in ecology. In actual terms, the number of qualified curators is, is related to the value or appreciation that society puts into taxonomy. According to Terry McGlynn, the field with the greatest importance to appreciation ratio is taxonomy. And actually we have reached that stage we call taxonomic crisis, sometimes known as the age of the great taxonomic impediment. This is unfortunately happening side by side with the current sixth mass extinction in the age of the Anthropocene, as well as during the times when we need most drug discovery or solutions for managing new pests and invasive species, searching for better solutions to human-made problems, and the need to observe, to conserve whatever still remains for, for, our, for our biodiversity. Toward this need, what have we done so far? From 1992 to 2019, the MNH has been offering short courses, the most popular of which is Biodiversity for Beginners, and those courses partly cover few aspects of curatorship. In 2017, I, together with colleagues, reintroduced Bio 192, a course in curatorship for systematics majors at the Institute of Biological Sciences in UPLD, in a National Museums Conference, CLADES 2017, organized by the MNH. We also planned in 2019 for a UPLD short course on biological collections, curatorship for biological collections, and in January 20 this year, 
we had the first offering of Wildlife 292, or Curatorship for Wildlife Collections. We also doubled our efforts to attract students to systematics. Actually, from, have, from just having one or two majors in the past years, we're happy to say we have six. That's 200%, isn't it? We enhanced and coordinated activities to reach out to potential students. In the near future, we plan to embark on a future course available to a wider audience, possibly through UPOU and other UP constituent universities, and probably in collaboration with other museums in the ASEAN. So the offering of Bio 192 and 292 constitutes a great step toward achieving our goal of training future caretakers of our biological collections. In a way, that's uh, that's a way of assuring that when we, curators, as well as the very able, highly skilled museum technicians that we have, unfortunately, they are also age 50 and above, when we have retired, the knowledge that we have accumulated through the years will have been passed on. And the knowledge that we have accumulated, uh, I mean, and the accessions that we have sort of inherited will remain in perpetuity. Now, the, the COVID-19 pandemic and the general plans of action taken toward delivering courses and lessons via online mode has added further to the already great challenges of attracting and training future curators. For the lecture part, we have adjusted course syllabi, reduced requirements, we have recommended readings to our students, and I would say that maybe, just maybe, delivering the theoretical part of curatorship could be done online. How effective that would be is another difficult question. Because the greater part of the course involves lab and field work and museum work. In fact, for Bio 192, one third of the lab core of the lab part involves supervised internship for six weeks in the UPLB MH at a minimum of six hours a week. For both courses, the great part also includes hands-on exercises on preservation for research purposes and the development of exhibits or displays, as well as photography and recent uh, te te techniques. In connection with delivering lessons during this pandemic, I made inform an informal survey among my co-teachers, and here are some of their answers. So that's, actually, that's part of the variety of work that we inculcate to our students, including uh, during the course of their lab work, uh, they learn how the values of these uh, specimens, that when you take pictures, you always make, you, you always make sure that there are reference uh, rulers or reference specimens like a coin, so that sizes will not be questioned, will not be a question anymore. And, <clears throat> So these are the answers of some of my co-teachers. Some, some, many of their answers are related to logistical problems like uh, lack of glass, uh, even the basic glasswares, chemicals. These are common, but which this have become, these are common problems, but which have become more obvious during the lockdown. Also access to uh, laboratories, the inability to visit museums, <clears throat> other than the MNH to compare and differentiate management protocols and access to specialized equipment for preserving specimens. So more importantly, however, we teachers also have challenges <clears throat> beyond equipment, lab space, supplies and materials. Like everybody else, teachers were also not, are also not prepared for community quarantines. The late or delayed re release of policy actions on the part of our leaders added to our own anxieties. There are also questions related to pedagogy and other principles. For one, there is limited or no access to museum collections. So how do we curate online? Is online curation possible? If curation cannot be virtual, then how can we teach or learn curatorship online? Also, even UP teachers experience an unstable internet connections, making conferring with co-teachers and consultations with students difficult, and not all can afford up-to-date laptops and gadgets. Other questions focus 
on how adequate how to adequately support graduate students when most of our efforts understandably are target undergraduate students lastly if we ourselves become too pressured and stressed as teachers to function efficiently how do we manage at least to be still to still be there for our students of course i surveyed also our students our main learners and here are some of their answers our one as a student who lives in the rural areas the top three problems i face are this is one of our uh, systematics majors the difficulty of getting physical learning materials is and also curation curatorship techniques from professors is hard uh, i mean it's hard it's it is often hard to convey complicated procedures on video you also just cannot learn curatorship without seeing the specimens you are supposed to be learning about just flash on the screen you also said lack of reliable internet connection for, for zoom meeting and others meron po bang links links sa youtube which means it, youtube uses uh, uh, memory it's strenuous to think about studies when a large chunk of your income has been cut or increased our other students said living far away from home always is a struggle for me the, uh, so she this one is thinking of her parents who are old personally my routine is, this one is for he, she uh, i think she feels she's being caged so that's uh, effect on the psyche and third i'm currently staying here at my dorm because i'm still doing course requirements if i go home there will be no means for me to finish all the papers no wi-fi low signal i need to stay here near the campus for a few more months. Another student, this pandemic brought my brains into hiatus. I cannot do activities related to ACANS. Second, uh, curatorship cannot be appreciated without hands-on activity. Third, he said, I'm a teacher dependent person. So yes, I have difficulty adjusting to this new normal. I want one more, one, one other student, a graduate student fears that his family might contract the virus. So, and then and my internet connection is often unreliable and confined in the uh, in the house I, it's also challenging for me to focus on studies while taking care of responsibilities at home during this pandemic i believe being forced to stay at home affects our mental health it prevents us from doing normal routine etc so Therefore, students' challenges go, include but go beyond and are far above gadgets, internet access, and being caught unprepared into the new normal of online learning. They, like us, are in a constant tug of war between family responsibilities and academic requirements. The already great challenge is this already great challenge is ex ex exacerbated when one has to suddenly face reduced or cut off income sources and health related worries. There is that FOMO. Who, and those among us, those who are more privileged among us find this difficult to grasp. That is fear of missing out or the fear of being left out. Yung takot o pangamba na mapag-iwanan. Despite these hurdles, there are prospects in spite of the challenges there are opportunities i have mentioned about increasing demand for for access to museum specimens many of these are connected to museomics museomics herbarium genomics and the use of historical material to extract dna this is especially sought for extinct critically endangered or inaccessible species this is also there is also the prospect of digitization which should be discussed further by our director Dr. Jay-Z Gonzalez. I am just flashing here high resolution pictures which were sent by foreign museums in lieu of material which my student who studies cockroaches, Mr. Christian Locanes, was trying to borrow. There are other several things I wanted to talk about, but perhaps a blog entry or a future full-length article 
would better reflect all the issues we need to address in this topic. Undoubtedly, biological collections are part of our national, natural, and scientific heritage and are therefore priceless. We should also bear in mind that our teachers, our museum technicians, and most especially our students, who constitute our hope and the future caretakers of our treasures, are equally precious being human resources and need to be cherished, treated with tender, loving care. Let me end by continuing what I quoted from Terry McLean, which he wrote for Taxon Tax Taxonomist Appreciation Day in 2017. We are in deep tax in we are in a deep tax we are deep in a taxonomic crisis, and our own species created the planet's sixth major extinction event. Uh, for further forward, taxonomic work is the foundation of understand, understanding how to save what we can and make plans for our future. Any fix to the taxonomic crisis requires a recognition of the essential nature of the work of taxonomists and systematists, who are the curators, and the value of museum collections. We must show taxonomists how much they're worth to us. We need to back this up with necessary resources, of course. So with that, thank you very much. Maraming salamat po. Thank you, uh, Dr. June Lip, for a splendid talk about uh, curatorship. It is indeed a problem with all the aging. Marapit na rin po ako. Isang taon na lang kasama na ako dyan sa listahan. 52 to, to above. So we'll have our questions and answers, of course, later at the end of the session.